Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Teku Lee. I'm the Associate Director of the Haas Institute here on campus. And um, I have the pleasure and privilege of introducing uh, today's speaker. Javon Lewis is uh, trained as an economics anthropologist at the London School of Economics. He works broadly on kind of the political economy of uh, race and, um, excuse me, <clears throat> political economy of uh, race and uh, inequality. Uh, broadly speaking, uh, in comparative context, his primary sites for his research are uh, Montego Bay, Jamaica, and Tulsa, Oklahoma. And he works a lot on, I'm just going to copy your words here, on the <laughs> cultural mechanisms, really institutional sure forms, true, right? <laughs> and social practices uh, of the everyday that kind of um, shape uh, how we understand things like economic insecurity, volatility, uh, and race. And today, uh, you're going to shed some light on reparations, deferral, and this great coinage here, the promissory of poverty. So yeah. please give a warm welcome to Yvonne Spaghetti. Thank you. Thank you, Teku. Thank you, Takia. Um, you know, it's <clears throat> a real privilege to be a part of the Haas Institute and just the, the sheer dynamism that comes with putting a bunch of interesting people together. I guess I'll call myself interesting because you kind of said I was, so that's fine. Thank you very much. Um, so as Teku says, you know, I am trained as an anthropologist. I have a joint appointment here, uh, well, a triple appointment, right? So I'm a part of the Haas Institute um, as well as an assistant professor in geography and African-American studies. So thank you to my students who've come. Fantastic. Does it make me nervous? A little bit, right? Um, so <clears throat> coming to Berkeley, I had these two projects that I was juggling, right? So I've done my PhD research in Jamaica on something called the sufferation ethics of the market, right? Which, true to Teku's uh, description, really try to think about what were the everyday experiences of the economy where the economy is something as understood as a kind of landscape of poverty, right? Uh, before I began this job here, I had the chance to do a very brief research postdoc uh, in Tulsa, which brought me to the United States and which to, not really my surprise, but to my fascination for sure, there were some of the very same kind of registers that I had explored and discovered, not discovered, explored in a way uh, that, you know, made Jamaica and Tulsa, Oklahoma feel very familiar, right? So something of a kind of black diasporic political economy, right? So on a couple of occasions, I've had a chance to speak before my colleagues in Haifas, and I've always talked about Tulsa, perhaps ad nauseum. So I thought, well, today, let's try and do something a bit different. How about bring some of my Jamaica work uh, to campus? And so today's title, right, is the Reparations Deferral and the Promissory of Poverty. And it deals specifically with the case of Jamaican lottery scamming. So lottery scamming, let me just make clear, is a criminal activity, right? Now, let's try and think outwards from that, okay? And I want us to think about crime and the logics of crime, in fact, as I'll describe here, the rationalizations of crime as being a part of the broader circuit of rationalizations that black people kind of take up in their understanding and navigation of their experience of poverty. Right? And so one of the, I think, most fascinating productive tasks, you can come on through, it's all right. All right. Um, of being in the Haas Institute is trying to make anthropology and geography much more responsible to theorizations of poverty. Right? In both of those disciplines, you know, there's, there's certainly a, a fair amount of familiarity and even comfort in thinking about development. But when we begin to think about poverty specifically, because of the, the legacy of the culture of poverty, there is for sure a reluctance to actually speak to poverty in a manner which is, in a way, definitive. So today, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to bring my background in economic anthropology with some theories that derive out of economic anthropology, such as reciprocity, the anthropology of exchange, to think about Jamaican poverty, and specifically Jamaican race poverty. So because of that training in anthropology, especially British anthropology, I'm going to read a paper, right? Uh, we don't present, 
we give a paper. So I will be reading a paper as well as trying to entertain you with a few of these slides. I'm really not that good at them, but we'll see. Okay, so just ahead of my talk, thank you very much for, for coming and for your attention. <clears throat> for the urban poor in Jamaica, poverty is an immutable state of economic precariousness or suffering. Positioned as being ontologically incapable of progress, suffering functions as a comprehensive site enabling simultaneous registers of inhabitants. Across its varied experience, that inhabitants materializes through multiple organizing and reconciliatory articulations and ethical moral framings. This paper is concerned with the response to poverty as demonstrated through the practice of Jamaican lottery scamming, which is a money transfer scheme that deceives Americans through phone solicitation into wiring large sums of money to Jamaica through financial service companies, Western Union, and MoneyGram. The scam is seen as a form of reparations for the long histories and circuits of colonial and post-colonial inequality. Reparations in this paper will be explored through a logic of seizure, where scammers reformulate sites of transgression and modes of repayment. Doing so asks us to consider the concept of reparations in the Caribbean, revealing it to serve as more than a means of recompense refused by one party and expected by the other. Instead, reparations become an, ex an engagement that defines the continued productivity of post-colonial relations of poverty where transgression and transaction proffer novel forms of reciprocity. Best, friend, best friends Dwayne, Omar, and Junior ran the crew of scammers that I studied. There were several other individuals who participated intermittently and who served supporting roles. Junior, who started scamming first in 2008, was the crew's leader. Each member of the crew had gone through the Jamaican public school system, with some having finished their high school O-levels and others dropping out beforehand. They each had been variably involved in one occupation or another, but mostly casual labor. Every member of the crew lived with his family, the exception being Junior, who had children with his girlfriend and so lived between his family home and that of his partners. The group lived in the same housing development scheme of Elizabeth Commons, which built as low-income housing through the Urban Development Corporation in the late 1980s is one of the more celebrated housing accomplishments of St. James Parish. The neighborhood was a mixed community of the unemployed and the working poor. Though the crew considered their scheme to be impoverished, one could see aspiration across the entire community, as noted in conversations with residents and metaphorically evidenced by the remaining steel reinforcing rods or rebar that left uncut through first story roofs, reached upward in anticipation of the second story's eventual addition. It was that same figurative confluence of poverty and aspiration that served as the immaterial motivation behind the scam. But materially, the crew was after the wealth represented by their potential victims. Attaining that wealth began with acquiring data. The crew, like all scamming operations, got victim information in the form of lead lists, sold by brokers working between Jamaica and the United States. These lists contained the names, contact details, and other personal information of potential victims, and sold for as much as $5 US per name. Leadless brokers compiled the data by sending out bogus mass mailings purporting to be sweepstakes entries. Some lists, however, are drawn from access legitimate sweepstakes and raffle entries at casinos, as well as customer data from retail operations. Once victim data is acquired, everyone in the crew did one of two jobs, phone work or money collection. Collecting the money carried the most risk, as by the time of my field work in 2012, scamming had already become well publicized since the practice's beginnings on the outskirts of the parish in 2007. Money transfer companies had become increasingly suspicious of multiple transactions or transactions in particular amounts. Therefore, the money collector had to be willing to travel between branches and also have a personal profile that would not raise suspicion. For this reason, the primary money collector in the crew, Duane, had an official job in that he had an employee ID from a position that he once held. Omar and Junior did collections when the volume of transfers picked up or when they determined that Duane might have frequented a particular branch too often and become compromised. Alternatively, the crew would dispatch its supporting members. 
Over time, as money collection became difficult due to increased protective measures being implemented by transfer companies, the crew and scammers on the whole came up with increasingly clever means to collect their money. One method was having victims deposit funds directly to Green Dot Money Pack prepaid debit cards online. However, these alternative methods never entirely supplanted the direct collection of funds from money transfer branches. Lots of scams, as their name suggests, are often presented as if the victims have won a prize in the form of money, a car, or a combination of awards. Scammers tell their victims that their names were randomly drawn from a national registry. Interestingly, the long-running rewards program, Publishers Clearinghouse, is invoked as a familiar reference to give the unexpected winning a sense of plausibility. For victims to receive their lottery prize, they are asked to pay taxes and transfer fees. These fees inevitably increase, leading victims to pay in the thousands and even tens of thousands of dollars. So here we have, courtesy of the Wall Street Journal, the kind of process, the circuit of scamming. Right? So here, the scammer phones a victim, getting the name and number from a contact list. Here it says, great news, you've won $2.5 billion on a car and a lottery. I didn't enter a foreign lottery. You probably entered it automatically at a store. What color car do you want? Or there are a few small fees, right? I need to buy a payment, I need to buy a payment card to send money. The victim becomes frantic as scammers uh, phone repeatedly, escalating demands and impersonating government officials. And after the victim sends thousands of dollars, family members often step in, they freeze bank accounts and cut phone servers. So this is a very <coughs> gendered, even ageist way of thinking about the lottery scam. And as I'll maybe mention later in the Q&A, this kind of infographic was really one of the main tools in the arsenal of the U.S. government to try and combat lottery scamming as the Jamaican government literally had no laws in place to protect against lottery scamming. Right? Okay. But this is, in fact, how the scam originally began. In 2007, these were some of the, the kind of narratives. The premise of Junior and his crew's scam diverges significantly from this model. In their scam, they notify their targets of having been owed a sum of money by a representative from the U.S. Credit Claims Commission. The commission, rather sophisticatedly, informs victims who are referred to as clients, in that sort of scammers talk about them as clients, that there were errors in the calculation of their credit APR and that they are eligible for a reimbursement for overpayment. However, to receive the payment, as with other scams, they have to pay processing fees. The trick here is that these charges are themselves subject to interest compounding, making for difficult amortization and thereby prolonging the duration and profitability of the scam. There was a belief among the group that the scam was the most viable and profitable means of gaining real wealth and advancement, especially when compared with the limited means of alternative opportunity in Jamaica. As Junior put it, yo, you have to max out your own thing because nobody's going to look out for you. You're here dying for hunger like a dog. What are you going to do? You have to survive. That's the game. Survival is the game. Dwayne, concurring, added, man has to survive right now. At the end of the day, nobody has any money. It's the same survival for them. I've marveled it out already, so I've worked it out already that I need to take what I want and need because nobody's going to give it to you. Underneath that argument lies a critique of local development processes, and in particular their failure. As sufferers, the crew are acutely aware of their limited importance to the state. They, like many Jamaicans, have failed to realize the economic justice and social equity envision that Jamaica's independence. Popular political narratives following independence promoted a common ideal vision of general social equality of a nation in which the black majority would have greater access to state power and education, as well as greater control over economic resources. The promise of that vision is what Jamaicans would hope to see reflected in their government support for them in the marketplace, where they could compete equally and equitably. The history of development on the island tells a story of that failed delivery, as contemporary economic circumstances have done much to erode the sovereignty's gain through decolonization and independence. And so it is unlikely that the independence vision ever <clears throat> could ever be brought to fruition by a government burdened by debt and made sclerotic by the rigidity of structural adjustment and other neoliberal mechanisms of governance. 
Scamming then is a product of the structural adjustment policies that have in many ways brought Jamaican development not much further than it was at independence, yet left further retrogressed by the expending of independence era optimism and hope. Scammers, therefore, have as their only resource the openings made available in this landscape. Many scammers, like Junior's crew, entered the practice citing the lack of legitimate opportunity in Jamaica and the negligible returns on any that are, in fact, available. To them, Jamaica is full of potential yet restricted opportunity that is somehow just out of reach. They have decided, therefore, not to accept those circumstances and have thus taken what they find as necessary, albeit illegal, steps to circumvent them. They refute the structure of exclusion and difference of an unstable economic environment caused by such structural adjustment and sees wealth as a means of making claims to appropriate conditions for wealth creation, which has increasingly been read through a rationale of reparations. Public discourse around reparations had been gaining increased purchase in the Caribbean for several years when in 2013 the CARICOM Reparations Commission, hereafter the CRC, was established. CARICOM, which is the acronym for the Caribbean community, is a multi-state organization promoting economic integration and cooperation among the member states of Antigua and Barbuda, the Bahamas, Barbados, Belize, uh, Dominica, Grenada, Guyana, Haiti, Jamaica, Montserrat, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Suriname, and Trinidad and Tobago. The CRC emerged out of the 34th regular meeting of the Conference of Heads of Government of CARICOM in July 2013 in Trinidad. Renowned Barbadian scholar of economic history, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, published a 2013 text, Britain's Black Debt, Reparations for the Caribbean Slavery and Native Genocide, which pro proved to be influential enough that year to inspire a proposal to begin a program of inquiry into the case for reparations against the United Kingdom, sponsored by the Prime Minister of St. Ne St. Vincent and the Grenadines, uh, Ralph Gonzalez. The CRC, chaired by Professor Beckles, quickly established nap national reparations committees across the member state nations. Within a year, on July 16, 2014, the CRC presented its case to the House of Commons in the Parliament of Great Britain. Beckles opened his speech with the following. I speak this evening in this honorable chamber of the House of Commons as chairman of the CARICOM Commissions on Reparations. My colleagues of the Commission are tasked with the preparation and presentation of the evidentiary basis for a contemporary truth that the government of Great Britain and other European states that were the beneficiaries of enrichment from the enslavement of African peoples, the genocide of indigenous communities, and the deceptive breach of contract and trust in respect of Indians and other Asians brought to the plantations under indenture have a case to answer in respect of reparatory justice. The CRC's campaign asserts that European governments where owners and traders of enslaved Africans instructed genocidal actions upon indigenous communities, created the legal, financial, and fiscal policies necessary for the enslavement of Africans, defined and enforced African enslavement and native genocide as in their national interests, refused compensation to the enslaved with the ending of their enslavement, compensated slave owners at emancipation for the loss of legal property rights in enslaved Africans, imposed a further 100 years of racial apartheid upon the emancipated, imposed for another 100 years policies designed to perpetuate suffering upon the emancipated and survivors of genocide, and have refused to acknowledge such crimes or to compensate victims and their descendants. The demanded responses to these charges are offered in the CRC's 10-point platform for reparatory justice from former colonial powers, known as the CARICOM Reparations Justice Program, or the CRJP. This program of reparations requests a full formal apology, repatriation support where sought, indigenous people's development programs, cultural institutions development, the addressing of public health crises, the eradication of illiteracy, the development of an African knowledge program, psychological re rehabilitation, technology transfer programs, and debt cancellation. It sounds all right. <laughs> the demands of the mission and the claims of the CRC appear seemingly only entertained, if not entirely disregarded, if we view the statements of former UK Prime Minister David Cameron in 2015, one year after Beckles' visit to Parliament. Prime Minister Cameron, minimizing his country's responsibility for slavery reparations, announced regional development funding for infrastructure 
in the amount of 300 million pounds. While imploring Jamaica along with Britain to, quote, move on from slavery's painful legacy, end quote, he also announced 25 million pounds in British aid for prison construction in Jamaica so that the country's nationals serving sentences in the United Kingdom could be increasingly deported to carry out their prison terms on the island. This for Cameron was what reparations looked like. The prison offer was eventually rejected by Jamaican Prime Minister Andrew Holness, not out of any kind of moral commitment, but rather over the concern that his government would be responsible for funding 60% of the ultimate cost of the construction and operation. In the same year, the former president of France, Francois Hollande, similarly deflected Haitian calls for reparations by offering financial support through assistance in modernizing Haiti's educational system and other forms of investment instead of formal reimbursement. And in a kind of laughable move, if I can just add this, Hollande referenced the fact that post the 2010 earthquake in Haiti, that France had kindly forgiven $77 million of Haitian debt to France, while completely ignoring the fact that since 1824 to 1947, Haiti has paid over 150, no, sorry, 19 billion, 21 actually, $21 billion in independence reparations to France for the loss of property, i.e. slaves and plantations. He paid that to 1947. So after, after Haiti's independence in 1804, a condition of their independence was that they owed France for loss of property. So, it was, it's, so the estimates are between 19 and $21 billion paid from 1824 to 1947. And so we think of Haiti in its contemporary development context as being inherently impoverished, but it's by design. This is not to mention the collusion by Western nations in sanctioning Haiti right after independence, lest other black nations arise out of former colonies or colonies at the time. <coughs> Reparations as figured by the CRC function as a quantification of redress, which renders restitution as an accounting of accumulated injustices for which appropriate former colonial powers are responsible. Reparations thought of this way leaves open the question of if reparations are owed, what form should they take and in what amount? The CRC's platform identifies the forms in calls for remedying chronic social problems and demands for structural investment in areas of development that for the organization would go some distance in their minds in making whole black communities in the Caribbean. One could make the argument, however, that what the CRC endeavored toward is a program of macroeconomic reparations through a comprehensive development program that avoids individual needs for reparative justice. In their program, the most radical demand is the nation-to-nation -nation debt amnesty. Debt here has a potent value because it both contains the qualification of the crime of slavery's recognition and serves as the quantification for its repayment. It is debt, ultimately, that ties together the formerly colonized and their former colonizers in an arrangement of post-colonial relations. Thinking with debt allows for the tracing of what Anne Stola has called the fact of living both colonial relations that are alive and well and post-colonial predicaments at the same time to emphasize a colonial presence CE, in its tangible and intangible forms, and to acknowledge that there are colonial presence, tempora manum. Debt's ability to maintain such a relationship is made possible through the working of transactional reciprocity. Reciprocity remains an exchange practice that produces social relations of obligation. It is within those relations of reciprocal obligation that groups seeking repair and the parties from which they seek it are situated. Considering a reciprocal relationship produced from the crime of transatlantic slavery requires some rethinking of the way reciprocity works as tra a transaction. The notion of reciprocity as extensively debated in the anthropology of exchange is founded upon an initial act of giving, which is followed by a receiving, which requires a reciprocal giving, producing, a, a, producing and deepening social relations as the process is repeated. However, within the context of slavery, the receipt of the free, although not freely given, labor of enslaved Africans would seemingly disqualify their 
being an initial act of giving, instead highlighting the vicious receipt of taking. Rather than accepting that disqualification, however, I am prompted to question whether there can be a gift derived from, death, from theft. I would argue that, yes, there can be, when we consider that the violent coercion of black labor would go on to produce industries, economies, and multitudinous global systems, alongside, of course, the torture, death, and sorrow, that accompanying them produce black subjectivities made perpetually available for repeated exploitation across generations, or sadly, a gift that keeps on giving, as it were. The theft of black life and the inequalities that have followed does not fully qualify as an engagement in reciprocal relations, and perhaps only satisfactorily serves as an unjust act that demands restitution. However, returning to Beckel's quote, contemporary truth, where he asserts that Great Britain and other European states were the beneficiaries of enrichment from the enslavement of African peoples and the exploitation of others, it is a productive outcome of the taking that black people in the West recognize as their deed of giving. And it is on that basis that they seek recompense. In this way, reparations claims speak to the gifting of Western benefits by black subjects, thereby turning a Western white taking into black giving. This move, following an argument made by Beth Pavanelli that reparations is a mode of compensation and implies a moment of consent, further places the formerly colonized into a relationship of reciprocity with their former colonizers, making possible the continued existence of a post-colonial relationship that is maintained by the anticipated repayment of debt. Centuries of waiting for this colonial remediation has meant that contemporary reparations claims in the Caribbean are part of the long memory of injustice that sits in the hearts and minds of black Caribbeans. The memory of those injustices and the debt that it produces has failed to fade away due to the memorializing cultural practices of these once enslaved and former colonized societies. However, more importantly, recollection is a result of the continued presence and involvement of those former colonizing nations as they endeavor to maintain the relationship of benefits. However, from the vantage point of former colonizers, a statute of limitations has been reached, making any formal repayment or even proper apology seemingly unnecessary. As such, only, quote, moral debts are recognized, while financial accounts are kept in arrears by assertions like Hollande's in Haiti in 2015, saying, quote, we cannot change the past, but we can change the future, quote, <laughs> empty platitudes. In fact, recalling the earlier discussion of his and Cameron's respective development programs, the governments of these nations might also argue that they have done much since slavery to contribute to their formerly colonized territories. In Jamaica, Perhaps these contributions can be counted among the activities that include emancipation in 1834. Oh, okay. Whose offering, <laughs> uh, who's offering, however, demanded the continued giving of black labor through post-emancipation apprenticeship. Full free or absolute abolition a few years later in 1838 guaranteed for the British the re-giving of 124 years, to be precise, of productive returns on the colonial rule. Independence in 1962 quickly gave way by the late 1970s to the post-colonial procedures of structural adjustment programs and their tools of privatization, austerity, and lopsided trade deals. Again, these former colonizers saw increased returns as they offered rescue packages of debt restructuring through foreign corporations' establishment of businesses in the industries of tourism and business processing outsourcing that extended very few benefits to black and poor Jamaicans. Let us not also forget to count Cameron's offer to build a Jamaican prison, which is perhaps an, ex an expected deportation-flavored conclusion to a migratory pattern that brought surplus labor to Britain shores for decades. To be sure, proper accountancy across this 300-year period includes the significant costs paid by Jamaicans in their efforts to gain these, quote, advancements. After all, emancipation was earned through generations of sacrifice and suffering. The process I have briefly recounted could easily be construed as an amortization of colonial debt. We know how this debt thing works. You have a credit card, you borrow, you pay back. Interest, you borrow, you pay back. It's a continued thing, right? So maybe this is how post-colonial debt gets repaid. The bank is always coming back for more. My purpose in highlighting these leaps of activity across centuries is to illustrate acts of giving, receiving, and re-giving through what Mary Douglas called the reciprocal catalog of transfers that makes up society. 
Doing so calls upon Maurice Block and Johnny Paris, often cited. These are some old school anthropologists. Uh, so calls upon the often cited idea of transactional order to show that post-coloniality is a, quote, long-term cycle of commitment bound up in relations of morality that enables the reproduction of the social and cosmic order. This demonstration of the residuals of injustice shows that the primary mechanism by and the extent to which reciprocal relations are defined, and that through which the post-colonial social and cosmic order is produced, is through the work of deferral. Thinking across that long duration of time. As literature of the anthropology of exchange has shown, delays in reciprocating transactions are critical to relationships of patronage and debt and the establishing or dismantling of hierarchies. The reparative debt owed to black Jamaicans is unlikely ever to be materially settled in any meaningful or reasonable way if we take as an indication European government's rhetorical framing of the responsibility as being simply a matter of moral accountability. The non-payment keeps the post-colonial relationship viable by breaking the initial fiduciary promise of emancipation. Anne Stoller's writing on imperial formation is instructive on this point by urging us to reckon with the logic of unfinished projects within colonial domination and the gradual process of earned sovereignty. She writes that imperial formations, quote, are states of deferral that meet out promissory notes that are not exceptions to their operation but constitutive of them, end quote. Delinquency through deferral, then, is the operational mode of imperial domination, where credit is issued by the dominated. However, Caribbean nations lacking geopolitical wherewithal and import are only capable of making reparative claims, but without guarantees. As a result, they suffer this detrimental delinquency, with the only gain being the moral political stability of their claim. To maintain any hope of reparations, they must remain tolerant of their accused enduring deferral. Relations of poverty are therefore manifest in the open-ended or ambiguous and unspecified terms of the promissory's arrangement. Life lived within the deferral of reparations for slavery is an experience of the material and structural deficiency, deficiencies of post-colonial Caribbean society, which have produced subjectivities that have likewise taken on the character and pronounced sensibilities of deferral. The experience can be understood as being situated within the long emancipation, to borrow from Ronaldo Walcott's accounting for the current moment of blackness, as still existing, quote, within the time of emancipation, and that freedom, which is extra emancipation, or in other words, beyond the logic of emancipation, is yet to come, end quote. The withheld recognition for the crime of slavery, which if fully recognized would signal culpability and come with a compensatory obligation, renders Caribbean nations and their citizens in geographies of suspension, of incomplete liberations, under-realized independences, and in an immutable state of economic precariousness. In such a landscape, accompanying hardships are relations, practices, and vocabularies that, particularized through race, produce a social and economic topography that is uneven and unequal. For poor Jamaicans, this experience of the furrow constitutes the frame of sufferation, which is a social condition, again characterized by an inability for economic progress, despite one's ambition, materially maintained through abiding foreign indebtedness, economic stagnation, and deficient development. Sufferation is thus a state of prolonged suspension, in which one endures conditions of inequality in watchful anticipation. Sufferation is the modality of deferral, which producing a state of poverty is the lived outcome of the promissory note never intended to be fulfilled, what we might otherwise call poverty. Again, the open-ended quality of the debt owed enables the manipulation of impoverished Caribbean subjects who, enduring in sufferation, anticipate the completion of their emancipation through reparations. Deferral mobilized as a post-colonial strategy of domination produces a one-sided form of reciprocity that benefits former colonizers, the sort that is much in line with Marshall Salen's definition of negative recipro reciprocity as the attempt to get something for nothing with impunity. Caribbean governments, however, are locked in the reciprocal relations of inequality as they are bound by the process and politics of recognition. However, with cunning attention to the manipulation of the logics inherent in reciprocal relations, scammers deftly maneuver within the already existing and demonstrably durable expectations of non-payment on the part of former colonizers and the non-receipt according to the sufferation ethic of poor Jamaicans to profit from the deferral's continued cycle. 
Scammers do this through the technologic and economic registers of the lottery scam that produce a reparative logic that reformulates sites of transgression and the currencies and processes for repayment. The practice as seen through this lens is understood as a form of reparations for the long histories and circuits of colonial and post-colonial inequality. The practice reveals reparations as serving as more than a means of recompense withheld by one party and ex expected by the other. Instead, it becomes an engagement that defines a continued pro productivity of post-colonial relations where, again, transgression and transaction proffer novel forms of reciprocity. As the efforts of the CRC continue to make reparations a headline media item across the Caribbean, it also became a ready discourse among the crew in the justification of their scam. As it will turn out, the justification through the frame of reparation was bolstered, if not significantly introduced, by the release of reggae artist Vibes Cartel's scamming ballad aptly titled Reparation in 2012, one year before the CRC's formation. The lyrics of the song were a psalmic extolling of scamming's merits and the opportunities scamming provides for Jamaica's poor youth and carefully emphasized the practice's positive attributes, including the lack of violence it produced at the moment. Let's hear it. The song, which was initially banned, forcefully expresses a critique of the lack of available social and economic support in Jamaica. This argument is especially salient for the country's poor youth who are not as cartel recognizes, imbued with the sporting and entertaining talents that he, Usain Bolt, or the popular Jamaican dancer Ding Dong possess. Abilities that seem to be the only registers of value Jamaican capability and mechanisms for advancement. Scamming is viewed then, as the song implies, as a justifiable practice given the economic environment. This rationale thereby sets the logical framework for the practice to be interpreted as a legitimate form of reparations, which in this view is determined solely on the merit of need, while giving no account to the history of slavery or colonialism as a parative basis. The only mention, in fact, of England is sterling pound, pound sterling. The claim of reparations then is made more strongly when based upon contemporary conditions, which are more perceptible than the affective moral inheritance of slavery's injury. Cartel's dance hall politics of reparations were endorsed by and completely influential for the members of the crew. Those politics held a vernacular power that spoke directly to the ethical positionality formed in the experience of race poverty. As a result, they were less concerned with the injustices of slavery than with the explicit poverty that they and their community currently endured. The injury was not the theft of life or the burden of forced labor across centuries, but that after all of that, they were still sufferers. What they read across a comparative lots of those like them and of others whose fortunes were distinctly better off, what amounted to disparities of race and nationality, 
was the real matter of in need of repair. For the crew, reparations claims embody a counter discourse that provides the means by which contemporary inequalities are historicized. In response, they shifted their reparative gaze away from the nations from which CARICOM seeks reparations, former colonizers like Great Britain, and toward what they identified as a much closer and relevant contemporary site of iniquity, the United States. The move identified for them what Obika Gray has noted as the disjuncture between the misery and hardships of Jamaicans' lived experiences on the island and the imagined experience of participating in the material well-being of the United States. Compensation, thus, is seen as necessarily coming from the United States, as it has in the contemporary Jamaican imaginary become not only a site which produces notions of mobility and aspiration, but also transgression. Most importantly, by that material well-being, the United States holds the desired currencies for repayment. I asked the crew how they squared their scamming as a reparative activity. Their response, at once convenient and compelling, was articulated as a natural moral response to the experience of poverty. <clears throat> Omar noted, I can't feel a way or feel sorry for them when we have so little and them are foreign or in America. So foreign is the common nomenclature for anywhere abroad, but specifically the United States, have so much and they still want more. The logic was unsurprising, but admittedly I was dubious, but according to Junior it was simple. Is we, is it, okay, yeah. is we who poor and have nothing, and is we that make them have what them have? However, how do we actually account for a historicization that skips across time and geography, transforming Britain's transgression into Americans? To understand this genealogy, we must trace the post-colonial custodianship of Jamaican exploitation, which has changed hands over the decades with the reorientation of British-Jamaican trade and political relations to that of Jamaica and the United States. Through the transference of that transgression's proprietorship, the scammers in the crew pliantly reason that the U.S. acquired Great Britain's moral debts in a view which conflates race with a shift in geopolitical power and labor relations. Duane expresses belief when he explained that England used to, but now the U.S. runs Jamaica. The idea of the U.S. running Jamaica was not an abstraction. It forms from real experiences and through what Mimi Shala calls the grammars of racial difference encountered with Americans who made up over 60% of the country's tourism market in 2015. In the claim of, quote, running Jamaica, Duane articulates not just a moral sense of guilt inheritance, but a structural capacity for control by the United States and of that control experienced by Jamaicans. When asked to explicate on a seemingly complicated reading of race and restitution, Omar, with an unironic directness, remarked to me hilariously, are they not the same white people? I thought it was funny. Okay. <laughs> His response, more of a rejoinder than answer, nonetheless provided critical insight. The reference to them, whose meaning glossed both British and Americans as foreign, evidenced the marked semiotic quality of racial disparity, and accounting for the particular class-based reading of race in Jamaica, the fungibility of whiteness. Propping up his reasoning, white racial identification stands as a moral affordance for the scam's targeting of North Americans. In this conflation, race, and whiteness in particular, serves as a mode or function of inequality and thus offers a steady marker of blame across its permutations and exchanges. Scammers' reparative claims are made within reconfigured relations of reciprocity, adding heretofore unexpected operations. They complicate the post-colonial cycle of reciprocation by forcibly taking repayment. But their taking does not stop the cycle, but proves it to be a resilient and mutable process that is capable of introducing newer parties into its sequence. In fact, the force of taking amplifies the process by allowing for more pronounced counterclaims, which in reciprocal manner continues onward. Moreover, they are taking from sources connected to the original debtor by a symbolic set of relations, specifically here illustrates the transferability of debt through whiteness, manipulating the totalizing logic of race that often glosses minority subjects into singular entities. Doing so broadens the ability for claims to be made at a growing scale, charted along the tangled path of relations made through globalization and the compounding of injustices carried forward by neoliberal economic policy. Through a loophole of post-colonial liability, scammers are able to sustain a claim on the basis of enduring hardship and the growing caste of participants in its perpetuation, and benefit by hedging their symbolic reparations of actual returns, 
alongside the potentially and unlikely real reparations argued for by groups like the CRC. Within that loophole, they draw on the same logics of deferral to extract value and capital from victims, utilizing a similar mobilization of deferral and debt, as I have discussed, by using tactics to increase the compounding of interest through multiple efforts to force a delay in payments on the part of their victims. So to conclude, <clears throat> what we see with Scammer's use of reparations rationale, of a reparations rationale, is the mobilization of history to shape opportunities within current configurations of global power. The scam, as articulated through these reparative logics, remedies the injury of the colonial encounter, but also the post-colonial retreading of the sites of inequality and injustice by newer actors like the United States government, its citizens and corporations. U.S. entities and nationals are understood as having not only inherited but purchased the debts of British colonizers to extract further profit from the lives of Jamaicans. As such, reparations stand as a capacious ethical charge that accounts for growing assertions of injustice across the scale of the individual, the community, and the nation. However, rather than persist in the eschatological deferral of suffering, scammers like Junior and his crew have seized their share of repayment in the here and now. For Junior and his crew, scamming redresses the restricted social mobility many poor Jamaicans face by serving, to quote John Reutman, as a means of exercising claims to rights in a situation of dispossession and disempowerment. By scamming, these young men expand beyond the immobility afforded by the currencies of popular black culture that delimit the outer boundaries of opportunity, as scamming makes possible participation in the local and global economic and cultural circuits in more meaningful ways than the formal economy makes available. Scamming takes advantage of the apparatuses of globalized liberal capitalism founded upon colonial injustice, seeing them as resources to be manipulated through reparative logic. Manipulation becomes feasible through open-ended post-colonial relations that, if recognized accordingly, can expand the delimitations of opportunity by reorganizing the operative and ordering framework of sufferation. Indeed, through the reparative logic by which they seize capital, Junior and his crew practice what David Scott has referenced as a kind of freedom within the prevailing relationships of power. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Is that right? Yeah. What might be interesting to do is to also think about how this idea transfer, say, to the North American context, right? Because um, what was interesting about being in, in Tulsa, so Tulsa, Oklahoma is interesting because, in fact, there was no actual, let's call it, plantation system in Oklahoma, right? With majority of blacks coming much later after, after abolition. But in the response to poverty, you know, we have these kind of programs that say, well, they need more urban gardens because poor black folk want to garden, right? They want to grow their food. You know, I came upon a young man who, like, refused, he was a part of this program, and refused, absolutely refused to, like, grow eggplants or whatever it was, right? And, you know, his response, he was 14, so whatever comes after millennial, that's what he was. Um, he was like, well, I'm not a slave. I'm like, this is interesting, right? So there's a way in which there is this, this is very nerve-wracking, this photo thing. <laughs> no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah? All right. It's going to end up on the website, right? So I, mean, I want to make, make sure it looks good. Um, so there's this way in which some of these kinds of narratives travel, right? The narrative of slavery travels across generations, across geographies, but also the narrative of reparations, right? I mean, we've seen, you know, we've seen, I'm sure, we've encountered, you know, kind of casual occurrences where reparations is, in, is invoked, right? So perhaps we can do that in addition to asking questions about the actual paper. Yeah, or we can just go have some more food. Yeah, go ahead. This was great. This was really interesting. Oh. And I have a couple of things that are kind of running through my head because I know Jamaica a little bit. Yeah, you do. Which is that, so I wonder if there's a connection to be, to be made between scamming is a very, it, it shows up in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, given that there's such cultural saturation in Jamaica with this fascination of bandits and westerns, mm -hmm. whether there's a connection to be made between, in some ways, the thievery that's attached to scamming and this intense sharpness around black masculinity and the Caribbean and the idea of bandits, which is just, is 
circulates so pervasively. Mm -hmm. And the second is, is that when in Jamaica this, this past summer in Black River, which was like a port where slaves were disembarked and mm -hmm. sold, there was a, there was a new there was a new uh, plaque that had been put up to testify to the Zong massacre, mm -hmm. which had been a Liverpool slave ship that had then disembarked and on the way over they'd thrown over overboard 133 um, African slaves and then when they arrived in Black River they, they claim insurance. And yet the majority of the community nothing about the massacre and they also didn't know that there'd been this this, this parish effort to to rehistoricize that, that slave structure. And I wonder it felt very just it was it was silent. It was mm -hmm. like it was put to bed. There was no comment there was nothing. Right? Mm -hmm. And so this kind of the thinking of the connections being made to the deeper histories of slavery in response to the reparations movement, it just feels deliberate. Mm -hmm. there's, there's an excising and a silencing that's going on even today. Around reparations. And, and the deeper connections of local history to right. slavery and something so massive and bloody as the Zong massacre that was right there in the parish. Right. Okay. Just two questions. No, that's not really great. So what's interesting about, so to answer your first question, the, right, so we, we know Jamaicans love badness, right? I mean, it's a popular trope, right? So we have, you know, there's a whole bad man ethic. It comes out of this kind of rude boy emergence in the post-independence post era in Jamaica, right? So we had Jimmy Cliff star starring in The Heart of They Come, as being the kind of quintessential rude boy, right? Young, innocent guy, comes from country to town, gets mixed up in badness, right? Becomes an outlaw, a fugitive, etc. Right? And so there's been, a lot of, there's been a lot of thinking around the rude boy, right? And... And one of the things that, that that thinking has produced is thinking about the rude boy as a kind of response to what is at the time an independence kind of ethic of respectability, right? And working against that. And what's interesting, and I didn't have time to, to get into it in today's paper, um, is that what I found with scamming is the complete opposite, right? So once these guys are accumulating a decent amount of money, they go into actually quite respectable businesses, right? They're establishing, uh, well, rum bars, you know, it's respectable, right? You know, they're building a rum bar, you know, they're starting taxi services, they're, you know, establishing, uh, like, party promotion companies, you know, the, the kind of wantonness of men in the Jamaican kinship structure, you know, what I've seen is, and I'm not trying to generalize here, but, you know, what I've seen within the crew, at least, is there's been an increased investment in their families, you know, uh, sending your children to swimming lessons, Spanish lessons, you know, rather than going to the basic grammar school, they're now going to private schools in, in, in Montego Bay. Um, you know, so I think there's something interesting about, about that, right? And I think, I think there's something really convenient about thinking about scamming through the kind of rude boy trope, right? When talking to people like Junior, what they're seeing is this. They're in Montego Bay, they see all of these people. So Montego Bay is a tourist epicenter of Jamaica, the North, North Coast, but Montego Bay in particular. Um, they're seeing all of these people coming off the cruise ships, right? They're seeing all of these free zone centers, um, business processing, outsourcing companies being started. They're seeing all of this develop, ha developing happening or development happening, happening around them. And what they recognize is that in fact, for as much as Jamaica is giving, for much as they are giving as citizens, they're getting very little in return. And so they're reading that actually as a practice of crime. But what they're doing further to that is saying, well, if this is crime, but yet they're calling it capitalism, therefore capitalism is crime, what I'm doing is in fact no different. Right? And so it's not really about this kind of cultural ethical response. Right? It's about saying what I'm going to do, what in fact everybody around me who is established is doing. And I was able to actually trace this back to, you know, some local myths, right? And so, raise your hand if you know Sandals Resort. Come on, we holiday here, don't we? Sandals, yeah? It's on, you know? Pina Coladas and all of that, right? So Sandals is, you know, a Caribbean-wide chain of all-inclusive hotels, resorts, right? And it was founded in, I don't know, the late 70s, early 80s by this white Jamaican guy named Butch Stewart. So, and Butch Stewart, if you're watching, right? This is not a personal assault, right? But according to these local, these local accounts, Butch Stewart got his first Sandals money from, from you know, being involved instrumentally in the North Coast ganja trade in the 1970s, right? 
actually flying ganja marijuana out to the United States, I mean, out of Jamaica to the United States. And so there are all of these ways in which I say, well, this is how you actually get rich in the Caribbean. This is not about crime. In fact, many of these guys worked in call centers, right? So again, I didn't have a chance to get into that, right? So part of this whole development scheme is a national training agency, right? Where thousands of Jamaicans enter the programs in the promise of getting a job um, at one of the call centers, either because Amazon is in Montego Bay, ACS. Do you know who ACS is? Yeah? Okay, good. So ACS is one of the student loan services. Right? So it means you all are being very well supported right? by, your, by your departments. So ACS... <laughs> What's that? No, no? no okay. Oh, is that right? Okay, so maybe that's what happened. Um, so ACS is one of the, one of the um, student loan services, and its call center is based in Jamaica, right? And so what's interesting is that, you know, these, these guys, you know, either they themselves or they have family, you know, one in ten, one in ten Jama Montagonians, in fact, work within the call centers, work within the, the, free, the, free, the free zone. Um, they understand what kind of capital is slushing around these places. You know, you're calling, I have $90,000 in debt, and I need to, you know, so they're understanding that, whoa, you had $90,000. Or my Amazon, my two-day shipping, it didn't arrive on time, I'm ordering this PlayStation, whatever, for my child, and it costs $500. So there's a sense in which they're understanding what kind of capital is available. Yet on the other hand, they're saying, well, wait, we're getting at best a dollar to $2 an hour for, for, for this job. And so for them, they're reading this directly as, as capitalism, as crime. And so for them, they're not doing anything really bad. They're calling up somebody, and if you're dumb enough to fall for the scam, then that's on you. Right? Um, more on that later if someone brings up the question. Right? <coughs> so... Yeah, I'm not sure how to answer the second question, right? And, except for that there have been, you know, so Deb Thomas has the book, I mean, sorry, the, the documentary, uh, Bad Friday, that talks about the Rastafari massacre in 1963 in Jamaica, that the state largely covers up, right? That, in fact, until relatively recently, has not been commemorated in any kind of way. Um, What's interesting is that I don't think that these guys bring in some of these more local occurrences into their, into their logic, right? Because it doesn't, it doesn't serve, right? And, you know, don't get me confused. This is absolutely bunk, right? Like, this is not real reparations, and I don't, for one minute, give in to the fact of this being real reparations. But it's about what is, in fact, convenient narratives for them to make that claim. And so they're drawing upon what is, in fact, convenience. So if there is the case of the Zong, for example, and I want to you know, plug Michael Ralph at NYU's work. On, he's doing a lot of interesting work right now on slave insurance, right? Um, companies like Atna and so forth going back generations. Uh, you know, but something at this local level, especially something that's kind of... You know, it's not really far. Black River is not far from Montego Bay, right? I mean, but again, it's not a part of that kind of, say, uh, the... I don't want to call it uh, an orbit, right? But it's something of, like what is, in fact, a kind of usable narrative, and that doesn't really factor in. Yeah, hi there. Right. And so here's what's also very interesting about going back to, say, this question of crime, right? And so there are lots of other crimes in Jamaica, right? So we have like, the drug trade, the gun trade, etc. And there is <clears throat> a very secure political infrastructure and apparatus that is political and criminal at once, right? That is centered by the, the symbolic and material power of the, the Don. Right, the Don. Right, so you have the Don as the head of, you know, like a mafiosa boss or whatever. Right, who is a kind of broker of power. Right, with that responsibility comes the great need for acts of redistribution. Right, so you see the Don sending people's children to school. You see them helping to pay for all sorts of things, um, but that doesn't happen with scamming. Right, this in, for them there is this complete individualizing ethic at play. So I'm going to help my family, I'm going to 
buy a car or two, I'm going to build a house, but in many ways they're moving out of their neighborhoods, right? And they're bringing in people within a very limited kind of kinship scheme, right? It's not, it's not much broader than that. Um, and so, and I call them a crew because there is, you know, fantastic work about crews in Jamaica, um, uh, you know, which are these like friendship kinship networks that are there from childhood. And it's out of those things that, that, you know, the, those networks that the scamming, scamming crew emerges, right? So it doesn't need to go much further beyond that, right? So as far as, I mean, and also I think more to the point, so scamming starts in 2007, 2008, by 2013, you know, as I said at the beginning of the talk, you know, there was no actual legal infrastructure in Jamaica to come down on scamming. So what you had was the seizing, you know, the very predatory seizing of scammer wealth by local police, etc. So I'm going to arrest you, I'm going to take your car and your money and your computers and I'm going to boot you out the, the jail the next morning and no problem. However, in 2013, right, because of these, you know, because of these assertions, right, that the people getting scammed are grandmas and grandpas, right? So Dan Rather hilariously goes down to Jamaica in 20, 2013, actually, and is on a hunt for scammers. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's precious, right? Um, and, but because of this, right, the United States Senate Committee on Aging, right, as an arm of the U.S. government, comes down on the Jamaica government threatening sanctions. You guys need to up your game and get serious about lottery scamming. Because it's our grandmas and grandpas who are getting scammed, right? I mean, it's the United States Senate Committee on Aging that actually advances this policy. So even what I'm talking about in scamming is, is now really no longer happening, right? Because by 2013, you have the U.S. government coming down, right? You have the contraction of the market of lead lists, right? So again, lead lists being the names of these potential victims. The scarcity of the lead lists makes scamming become a very murderous activity. So people are killing each other now for access to these lists, right? Whereas in 2008, even up until 2012 when I was there, right, you really didn't hear that much about murder, right, as a result of scamming. But now Montego Bay has far surpassed Kingston as Jamaica's murder capital, right? Um, and so there's really nothing left to kind of hand over, right? And so later on in the project I talk about, I talk about these repercussions and I kind of update, update the model somewhat, yeah. Right. Um, thank you, I really enjoyed this talk. Yeah, uh, thank you. I have a conceptual question and then uh, just some more detailed questions. I'm wondering, sure. is there an effort among these crews to like geographically or racially isolate which foreigners they're targeting as their clients? Are mm. they looking specifically to white Westerners or do they, is there a sense of shielding other black Americans mm -hmm. from being victims of these scams? Um, and then I'm wondering um, about something you said before reading the paper about the cultural poverty argument, mm -hmm. the way in which you're trying to rethink poverty. And it seemed like in the talk you really used the idea of separation mm -hmm. to do that. Um, I'm wondering if you could just say a little bit more about um, what that term is invokes and, sure. and its challenge to the cultural poverty legacy. Okay, great. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, so, so first, to your first question, no, right? It's, it's whoever they can get. But what's important is, are actually the mechanisms by which lead lists come to scammers, right? The, the, the process by which these names come to be on a sheet of paper that gets sold, right? And so, as I said, you know, there are, you know, like if you're ever at the mall and you see that rotating Jaguar in the middle of the thing, like, don't put your name in for it, right? Because that itself is a scam, right? So, I mean, they're there to collect data and to sell your data, right? Um, information data. Um, so they have information from these kinds of places, from casinos, right? Um, and so what's interesting about those sites is that they already begin to kind of skew who gets brought into the kind of the realm of possible scammer victims or clients, right? But what I'm writing about now is actually about, so, I mean, to be fair, there are a significant amount of the elderly who get scammed, right? I mean, so the first convicted scammer who gets extradited to, to the United States um, for his crime gets 
extradited to, can we guess? Let's try and guess. It's really fun. No? Florida, Florida no. No? No, you can't guess. You never guess. Bismarck, North Dakota, right? <laughs> right? Bismarck, North Dakota, right? This guy takes over five and a half million dollars out of the community of Bismarck, North Dakota, right? Insane, right? So what I've been doing is I'm reading the transcripts, right? The court transcripts and the court dockets, right? I'm like, well, well, what's happening here? And what you see emerging, you know, are stories of, well, my husband, so these are all elderly people, my husband, you know, we need, we need help. You know, health insurance is not enough. This guy is promising, you know, $20,000. Do you know how far that could go in terms of paying for our medication? So there's a, there's a question that I'm trying to ask about white vulnerability here, right? And it's about, it's about the lack of support, in fact, right? So it's, a, in fact, revealing a kind of a counter-narrative to what scammers have come up in their imaginations, right? As of America being completely just, you know, <laughs> gold on the streets, that kind of thing, milk and honey, etc. Um, so it's about the circumstances of these victims that make them victims, and I think that's an important thing to note, right? Um, with that being said, the legless business is one that is in many ways driven by American citizens, right? So you had this one guy who was in fact from Florida, of course, he was from Boca Raton, um, also convicted along with Sanjay, Sanjay Williams, right? But he didn't get 40 years like Sanjay, right? Um, as running a data marketing company, right? And so what's interesting is about, so who are these players, right? These lead list curators, if you will, in the United States, and who are they targeting? What I can say is that from this one group that I worked with, everybody was white, right? So to the second question about suffering, right? And so, and so suffering is really about, some of my students would be happy with this, it's about making the move from anthropology to geography, right? In a way of, of thinking about, rather than thinking about poverty as being situated within a kind of cultural, with, within culture, right? About suffering as, as, as poverty as situated within geography, right? It's the structures of poverty that we live in. It's the way in which we read poverty geographically. It's the landscape of poverty. Right? And so I think on that basis alone, it, it is a, somewhat of a radical departure, right? at least from that one-time narrative. Right? Um, nevertheless, there is still something to be said about what kind of responses. Now, I wouldn't call these responses cultural formations necessarily, right? but there are certainly responses to poverty, but they're not... They're not endemic, right? Because once, once my guys here start making ten to $20,000 per month, you know, it's Spanish classes and, you know what I mean, Audis and things for them. They're not, you know what I mean? So there's, there's something there that I think we have to really question the, the kind of role of capital in that and the lack of capital, right? Mm -hmm. No, no. So um, thank you very much for the talk. No, thank you for being here. I appreciate you being here. Part of what you're talking about to me sounds like the underground economy that, right. you know, um, disfranchised, disfranchised people mm -hmm. engage in. Right. And the drug economy here is part of it with the notion that, I mean, drug dealers will think about, well, that's how the Kennedys got their money. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. The bootleggers, they were. Yeah. So that's very similar. Yeah, um, that's true, right? How, you know, your talk also reminds me of there's an awful lot of scamming kinds of things coming from Africa, mm -hmm. and it's over it, the email. Right. It's, have you thought about those parallels or what they're... Absolutely, right? I mean, and what's interesting is that, so I've actually been less interested in the email scams, right, than in the than in the actual pirating of oil reserves in places like Nigeria, right? Because, so what I've read and what I've seen so far is that while the kind of reparative argument exists in the email scam thing, right? What's interesting is that these pirates in Nigeria, for example, right, who are like pilfering off a shell and so forth, um, are using direct, right, direct kind of narratives of, of reparations, right? Mm -hmm. Colonial reparations, right? Um, and are similarly seeing American corporations or non British, non American corporations or conglomerates as similarly kind of being responsible, right? So again, thinking about the kind of mutability, the fungibility of whiteness and debt um, and responsibility. Uh, 
You know, so and I, I have thought about, like I said, the 419 email scams in Nigeria. And I mean, I think there's a way in which there is, there is, there is a usefulness of thinking with those, right? Uh, the difference, though, is that what we see with the Jamaican, let's call it the Jamaican, let's not call it the Jamaican scam. Right? Let's call it about the lottery scam in Jamaica, right? Because, <laughs> you know, yeah, uh, this is what we end up having, like Nigerian scam, right? Um, so I'm thinking through like the 419 scam and the lottery scam in Jamaica is, is that whereas in the former they're crafting an email and they're doing it very cunningly, right? They're misspelling on purpose, right? These people are not uneducated. Right? They're trying to trap the most gullible by having the most preposterous of scenarios right? and by spelling everybody word incorrectly. Right? So if you can see past the trapped general or whatnot, as well as his poor grammar, then you're probably a, a prime target. Right? In Jamaica, what they're doing, again, which is why I'm, I'm thinking more interestingly with the, the kind of oil pirates, is that they're using development apparatuses in Jamaica. Right? So they're saying, okay, well, I know we can call people. I know, how, I know the language. I've learned the language. I've been trained in the language of call center work, right? And they're using those exact same protocols and practices that are promised to bring wealth to Jamaica, to actually bring wealth to Jamaicans. In 2011, lottery scamming was noted to have brought 300 million U.S. into the Jamaican economy. Right? And so for me, that, that, that's a bit more interesting, right? Um, but at the same time, there are similar reparative logics and narratives that, that play out across scenarios. But I was trying to you know, say right after I finished speaking was that I think that is a kind of rationale that exists for any post-colonial, post-slave black subject. Right? I mean, we could see someone like walking into a Walgreens and nicking a couple of mm, Hershey's bars or something like yeah, that, reparations. I mean, it's funny, right? But it's, it's, it's yeah. Take cool. And then. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to sneak two questions. Okay. That's all right. Um, and you touched on the first one a little bit, but I'm wondering if you could say more about whether you um, interviewed or looked into what is the legitimacy of scamming among uh, Jamaican law enforcement? Right. Especially if they get the story that you're <coughs> laying out. Because, um, especially in terms of the hierarchy of different kinds of crimes that they could be focused on. This is uh, criminal activity where most of the victims are in another place. Mm -hmm. and if they appreciate the idea that economic opportunity and ethics of responsibility can have a positive effect on crime prevention generally, so they think you know that these uh, fellow Jamaicans who are not scamming, they might be engaged in other kinds of criminal activity where they don't have that kind of pathway right. to respectability. There's at least an argument that relative to other kinds of criminal activity, maybe law enforcement should be looking, should be turning the other cheek or looking for Right, somewhere else. right. Um, second uh, question has to do with, so it, it, it struck me that the um, kind of reparations manifesto of the you know, kind of CARICOM um, reparations commission started at item num number one with the apology, which um, always strikes me because um, you know, it doesn't really do anything to put food in anybody's mouth. Right. Uh, you know, Theresa May or Whitehall or Queen Elizabeth issue right. a formal apology. And there are all sorts of kind of uh, cross-cultural um, variations in what the cost of, like what the symbolic or cultural cost of issuing a formal apology. And I feel like in the, we've just seen in the US, you know, um, uh, Al Franken, you know, and C.K. Lewis apologized. Right. It's supposed to be better because in the U.S. apology, I think compared to a lot of other societies, are relatively cheap compared to our president. So it's a, it's just striking to me that apologies always formal apologies always seem to be item number one when their material benefits are you know um, are, you know not that easy to see. Right. Absolutely. So. Law enforcement was turning a blind eye. You know, it was, it was financially generative for, you know, the local economy of Montego Bay, St. James, and the country uh, overall. But, again, when the United States intervenes and says you have to stop, I mean, for example, another example is like, so for years, 
in the Jamaican House of Parliament, there were, there were, there were let's say, very strong recommendations to legalize marijuana in Jamaica for decades. Let's be the Amsterdam of the Caribbean, right? Who stops it? The United States, right? Um, so with lottery scamming, once these guys, you know, are told by the U.S., look, here are the consequences if you don't crack down on this. I mean, you have the United States forcing the creation of Jamaican law, right? So the Proceed of Crimes Act had no, no kind of response to scamming. Right? Because they didn't account for someone being, you know, under duress to be forced to give up money. Right? So it's in 2013 that everything changes. And then the government becomes itself invested in the in the in the kind of thwarting of, of scamming because who is being scammed? Right? And this is what's also very interesting. So scammers are targeting the exact market that the Jamaican government is targeting. Right? These are holiday seekers, these are people who come down on cruises, right? who stay in all-inclusive all resorts. Right? And so then there's a threat to Jamaica's brand reputation, right? and that's the kind of other side right, that comes in alongside the United States to really try to, to urge some, say, proper enforcement uh, against scamming. Now, the CARICOM apology thing, the reason why the apology is number one is because that's where every other claim begins. It's through that recognition. So if you think about like, so the uh, Truth and Re Reconciliation uh, Committees, it always begins with an apology or with the actual uh, acknowledgement of, of the crime. So I think Tony Blair at one point basically apologized for Britain's role in slavery and then quickly within hours or days had to backtrack and say, oh, well, what I really meant was, you know, it was a terrible crime and, you know, do well never to repeat it and, you know, sustain on our you know, our national history, but never to say we are responsible, right? Um, although we know that Barclays, you know, is a direct, uh, Barclays is a direct investor and completely directly profited from, from the slave trade, right? Um, so that's why it's number one, because it actually, which is an interesting, which is an interesting kind of um, move for thinking about reciprocity, right? So it's the acknowledgement. And the acknowledgement actually then moves the, say, the responsibility, right? And so right now, it, I call it the open-ended uh, reciprocal relations because these governments have not actually found themselves to be responsible, in fact. Yeah. Nancy, hi, how are you? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry I missed the beginning of the class. No, that's all right. Thank uh, you. Right. And I think that was its strength. Right. Uh, apologies mean different things to different people. Right. Native Americans want an apology. Oh, I think yeah. But other people you know, don't want it. Just the truth, just the closest you could get. But uh, what I was going to talk about is um, you know, the, the article that's often been cited uh, of the New Yorker, the Malcolm Gladwell's The Crooked Ladder. Mm. I don't know if that was discussed. No. But, uh, you know, he suggests that in the United States whether it was the Sicilians or the Irish, that they all were in crime. New, new immigrants have no other, <laughs> they have no other way. Right. And yet they don't want the children to be involved. Right. I mean, I've had mafia in my extended family. Right. And their children were sent to military schools and perfectly, you know, so there was uh, this question of socialization that I kind of mi you know, missed here. That, so that would be one. Um, and um, let me see, the other one, Oh, yeah, the, uh, sorry, I'm a little bit uh, out of it today. The 219 and how it operated in R Nigeria. Right. I followed one for six months. It was the most exciting thing I had ever done. I got, uh, I got one that said, uh, Dear Professor Shepard Hughes, you as director of Organs Watch might be interested in the fact that um, we, Dr. Harris or whatever, can um, accommodate so many uh, people who are in need of transplants. And we will do it as legally as possible. And um, we would like to know if you'd like to you know, hear our story. So I did for months. I had months 
I never quite, in the end, could figure out, I think one thing that was going on, with John, I'll tell you the end of it, uh, it ended with police. Uh, the, those uh, scams were also to humiliate people. Right. It was playing with people. Right. I don't think some of them, besides Dr. White, I, and you know, I would try to find out what's going on here. I think they just wanted to laugh. You know, I saw them, you know, maybe in some uh, kind of uh, Starbucks or whatever, wherever they were, you know, saying, look at this joke, grab the... Mm -hmm. So humiliation, I think, was part of it, and proving how much smarter we were than the other people. And this one, they actually played uh, a theater. Mm. And I think that's what they enjoyed. Every time I asked, I said, well, I'd like to know someone who already went to, they were going, was going to South Africa, that's right, it was, uh, it was somebody in West Africa that's saying, that we have, where do you have these hospitals where people can get transplants? They identified doctors. Mm -hmm. I spoke to fake doctors. I spoke to fake recipients. I spoke to um, donors who gave their kidneys or whatever and were very happy from all over the world. From, uh, they had me talking to people in Amsterdam, hear that on the phone. And uh, in the end, uh, I got so far, because I got kind of so excited about, what are they doing? What mm -hmm. are they doing? Do they think I really believe? Is this a game, or is this theater? In the end, I was getting um, where to send money offshore bank accounts. Then finally they said, OK, if you can come to Boston Thanks, at Mass General Hospital, where I knew the transplant surgeons, we can set up, because then I played as someone who had a relative who needed a kidney. If you come, we will get him matched, and within a week, he will have a kidney. So I actually was going to a conference mm. at that time, and I called Dr. De, uh, Delmonico, who was the head of transplant, and I said, uh, they have set up and prepaid for rooms in a hotel in Boston. And they were good, and they were good rooms. And they said, uh, well, all you need to do is bring a down payment of $5,000. Right. When I called, the rooms were held. The people had arrived in Boston. And I asked, when I arrived in Boston, the head of the heart of transplant to come with me into the room and just meet them so that we would have the complete story. And at that point, Veronica said, I'm calling the police. <laughs> right. And they, and they were, they were, I don't know if they were arrested, but they were thrown out of the hotel. I yeah. spoke to the hotel, and I said, I'm coming, but I have to let you know there's something shady that's going on. Sure. And I just, you know, I don't want the hotel to be, you know, be shot up or something. But it's a question of how far they will go. Right. And to what extent it, it's theater. Because I think there's elements of both. Right. Scams. Yeah, no, it's not kind of reparation. It is. Yeah. A kind of affective yeah. one in a way, right? I mean, so... Nancy Shepard used catfish oil, right? I mean, that's, 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 yeah, I mean, that made my day, really. Oh. So, there's a whole, like, subreddit, and there's, like, YouTube videos, like, Jamaican lot, like, people basically catfishing Jamaican lotto scammers, like, taking them through the whole process, right? Um, because for them, it's actually cathartic, right? Because they want to see these people suffer somewhat, right? Um, so, Again, you know, what's, what's interesting for, for at least the case with the group that I worked with is that they, and I think this is the part that you actually did miss, is that they also, I mentioned it at the end, I suppose, they understand the work of delay and the, and the drawing out of it, right? I mean, in fact, they purposefully do it. So once you, like, if you have your money ready and you go to call them, and I've been there, and they would just not answer Right, or they'll send you to a voicemail, and I could maybe play it, but you know, sorry, you know, you've reached the, you've reached the so so credit commission, you know, you take your call in the order that's been received, um, you know, I mean, I won't play it because we're recording, right, and it has one of the guys' voice on it, but you know, so they they actually engage in in what is it called? It's the Whenever you call customer service, it's that, it's that infuriating process of con constantly kind of, you know, round-robining you to people, right? To disorient you, to get you upset, to perhaps get you off the line. But for these guys, it's, it's them in mimetic manner trying to reproduce what is in fact 
a very genuine experience of calling somewhere like the U.S. Credit Claims Commission, right? We would expect to be on hold when we're trying to get free money, right? And so they make you wait on hold. And they understand it because these guys have been literally trained in call center work by Jamaica's National Training Agency, right? Which is supported and subsidized by all of these outsourcing companies. Um, you know, so for them, there is, it is theater. I mean, but don't be, you know, don't be mistaken. If the money doesn't come, they begin to get, to get violent. And I didn't have a chance to speak about it uh, today, but <clears throat> the whole techn technological kind of background to this, right? So they're using voice over IP technology, right? So what they will do is they will get a Berkeley number. If they want to target Berkeley, because, uh, you know, lots of rich professors live in Berkeley, right? They will, they will use this voice so well paid, right? Uh, Lisa lunch is good, right? So... <laughs> They would, have, they would change the area code to 510. Or better yet, they'll pay a little extra money and then get a business number. So they'll get an 800 number and call you. Right? Um, they have your data. So they will look you up. Right? They will find your place of residence on Google Maps and be like, oh, you see you live near Andronicos or near, right? And, right? and threaten you on that basis. We know where you live. You have such and such on this corner and that corner, and if you don't pay, we're going to have somebody come around, right? So that does happen. And, you know, to your first question about the generational kind of, say, avoidance of crime, I mean, it's exactly right. The, you know, not the unfortunate thing, but the impossible thing to trace right now, because, you know, the scam is actually, in fact, such a short-lived phenomenon, right? I mean, it happens still, but not in, to the same scale and to the, to the same kind of scale of profitability that it happened during my field work. Um, there's really no sense as to as to you know, what long-term benefits these next generations will have. For those who get away with it, you know, they have in fact you know, bought property, you know, they have, they have you know, assets, some liquid, some you know, uh, you know, in terms of cars or what have you, they have those things. And so in many ways that might in fact serve generations, right? Um, but unfortunately, we can't really know for sure on a larger scale. Uh, thank you so much. Well past our time. So All right, yeah, no, thank you. Thank you.